Again, friends in Radio Land, you're listening to the Old Fashioned Revival Hour coming to you from the Municipal Auditorium at Long Beach, California. I wish you would again pray with us as this international broadcast of the gospel goes out across the nations and the mountains and the sea, that God will use it for his glory. God's marvelous grace reached another milestone in our radio work, our 24th anniversary of broadcasting the gospel by radio. And just before the broadcast, for the benefit of the radio friends, we had a wonderful communion service here in the main hall of the auditorium at Long Beach, California. 
Our hearts are full of praise and thanksgiving for the open door for the gospel on the radio, for the strength to carry on, for the thousands upon thousands of you, our loyal friends, who through all these past years have stood by so wonderfully in prayer for this international broadcast. God bless you and keep you. No one <coughs> could be any richer in friends, real friends, than the ones, than the one now speaking to you has. Someday we'll meet around the throne of him who loved us and gave himself for us. Then, in my resurrection body and resurrection mind, I will really know and have the words then to express to you my heart of appreciation. My heart's too full today to really express what I would like to say. As I was telling some of the friends before we went on the air, if the Lord should tarry for the next twelve months and a year from now, if I'm not absent from the body and at home with the Lord, I want to celebrate the 25th anniversary of our radio work. Then it will have been a quarter of a century of gospel preaching over the ether wave. However, God knows best, and I have resolved as never before to make every Sunday as though it might be my last Sunday to preach the gospel and to beseech men everywhere to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. That's how I feel. And just in a moment I'm going to ask the chorus to sing The Rock That Is Higher Than I. Sometimes the shadows are deep and rough seems the path to the goal and sorrows sometimes how they sweep like tempests down over the soul. Oh, then to the rock let me fly, to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, then to the rock let me fly, to the rock that is higher than I. I just want the chorus choir to sing that for you, especially on this 24th anniversary. And I'm going to dedicate it to all the men behind the prison bars. God loves you. Flee to the rock that is higher than you. sunshine, a great audience here today at Long Beach, and they'd love to sing out to you this heavenly sunshine, and as you sing it, turn around, give everyone a good handshake, a real Long Beach welcome on the old-fashioned revival hour, all together, and shake hands now, heavenly sunshine, that's it, turn right around, shake hands. Right this way, 
lifted right up. Yeah, that's it. our head in prayer. Our Father, we thank Thee for Thy divinely appointed place of refuge, that in the midst of the trials and the storms and the testings of life, we have the open door of the ark of salvation, the pierced side of the Lord Jesus. May many come today and be washed in His precious blood and find a place of shelter, safety, and security and salvation. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I've cast my heavy burdens down on Canaan's happy shore. I'm living where the healing waters flow. I'll wander in the wilderness of doubt and sin no more. I'm living where the healing waters flow, living on the shore, I'm living on the shore, I'm living where the healing waters flow, hallelujah, yes, I'm living on the shore, I'm living on the shore, I'm living where the healing waters flow, with Israel's trusting children, I'm rejoicing on my way. I'm living where the healing waters flow. The cloudy, fiery pillar is my guiding light today. I'm living where the healing waters flow. Living on the shore, I'm living on the shore. I'm living where the healing waters flow. Hallelujah, yes, I'm living on the shore. I'm living on the shore. I'm living where the healing waters flow. I'm singing hallelujah, safely anchored is my soul. I'm living where the healing waters flow. I'm resting on his promises, the blood has made me whole. I'm living where the healing waters flow. Living on the shore, I'm living on the shore. I'm living where the healing waters flow. Hallelujah, yes, I'm living on the shore. Yes, I'm living on the shore. I'm living where the healing waters flow. This international broadcast of the Gospel of the Old Fashioned Revival Hour is made entirely possible by your free will offerings, sacrificial offerings. We are not sponsored nor endowed nor underwritten in any shape or form, and we go from week to week as God, through you, makes it possible. For twenty-four years now, God has never failed us. He has laid the burden of this broadcast upon the hearts of those who are willing to give cheerfully, not of necessity, but gladly for his cause. May you continue to have a part in this international gospel radio ministry for God's glory. Give us 
music, give them a good hand, will you? <laughs> I want you to know that Mr. Rudy Atwood's at the piano, George Broadbent at the organ, Mr. Leland Green is the leader of the chorus choir, and the quartet, that four fine-looking fellows, aren't they? Bill McDougal and, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Jack Coleman and Dick Brown and Arthur Jaisley, how I thank God for these who are laboring with me, making this international broadcast of the gospel possible. Honey, there are nearly 5,000 people here ready to hear you read the letters. I don't know how many more are in Radio Land, but it runs into the millions. So go ahead, well, honey, on this the 24th anniversary. We certainly are having a good time here today, friends. I wish you all might be here. Some good letters. Here's an amusing one from Toronto, Canada. Dear Reverend Fuller, my wife and I have wanted to write to you for a long time and tell you what your program means to us. It was not so very long ago that we simply hated the sound of your voice, dear Mr. Fuller. Our landlady, who was a fine Christian woman, would turn your program on so loud every Sunday morning when we wanted to sleep. Well, we tried everything. We hung blankets over the doors to help muffle the sound, and we even went so far as to plug our ears with cotton. But still, your voice simply screamed at us. She had the radio on so loud. Really, we did dislike you very much because you annoyed us when we wanted to sleep. Then something wonderful happened. One night, God's Holy Spirit convicted us of sin. And realizing our helpless condition, we took Christ into our hearts, and he became our Savior. What a load was lifted, and what sweet peace followed. Ours is such a happy home now. We have blessed fellowship with our landlady, 
and God's word becomes more precious every day. We have so much to praise him for, and not the least of these blessings is your program, which we now love. Isn't that amusing? What does the Bible say about becoming new creatures, and the things that we once hated we now love? That's a good letter. There's another interesting letter from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Dear Mr. Fuller, we've been listening to your program for some time now, and always wish we could be there in person, for we do love you all. This summer we were married, and so, thinking it will be now or never, we spruced up our old Ford car and went to visit the old-fashioned revival hour for our honeymoon. It was indeed a blessing, worth traveling 5,000 miles many times just to be there, and Mr. Fuller must have known that we were coming, for he preached from the Song of Solomon on the love of the groom for his bride. <laughs> From Illinois, lady writes, we have many financial responsibilities. However, we lost our only baby 22 years ago. If we were, he were living, we know that we would spend something for his Christmas gift. But now, instead of buying a cemetery wreath, we prefer to invest in your gospel broadcast, hoping that at least somebody else's son will hear the message and be saved for all eternity. God bless those parents. And now, uh, friends, the last letter is from Alaska. Dear Reverend Fuller, we're so glad that your program comes now on our own Anchorage station. All sorts of people listen to you up here regularly. Trappers in the distant places, shut off from the world, Eskimos, lonely folks old and young who feel so far from home up here. And I even heard you in one of the saloons now called a cocktail parlor. Men and women were sitting around listening to the music and were very quiet. An old Eskimo man asked me to write you and tell you that he always listens, and now, now he is sure that he will meet you in heaven. I tell you, Mr. Fuller, the world needs a whole lot more of what you are giving us, showing us sin don't pay, that God hates it, but he loves the sinner. An old woman said to me here, Mr. Fuller always has a lot of love in his voice. He seems to love sinners, too. Well, you brought me back to the Lord after I had strayed far away from my home teaching. My mother is in heaven now, and like the old Eskimo man, I know I'm going there because I've been listening to the old-fashioned revival hour up here in Alaska for over a year now. And that is all I shall have time for today, friends. The sun clouds may roll, quickly hiding the light that round me would shine. Still hope's sweet song is thrilling my soul, for Jesus the Lord is mine. Clearly sweet hope is singing, Jesus is mine, he is mine. Be the song is ringing through shade and shine. Though friends betray and prove me, though sorrows fall, grieve me onward, I'll go with Jesus, trusting through all. I mean, the light is falling, Jesus is mine, yes, he's mine. He's gently falling through shade and shine. Wonderful hope still singing, sweet hope divine is ringing, singing amid life's sorrows. Jesus is mine. Onward I'll go, trusting, bearing the load, bravely, patience and faith will my soul refine. Clearly sweet hope still sings on my road, and Jesus the Lord is mine. Clearly sweet hope is singing, Jesus is mine, he is mine. the song is ringing through shade and shine. Though friends betray and leave me, though sorrows fall, grieve me onward, I'll go with Jesus, trusting through all. Under the flag is falling, Jesus is mine, yes, he's mine. Gently falling through shade and shine, wonderful hope still singing, sweet hope divine is ringing, singing amid life's sorrows. Jesus
goes with me, I shall not complain. Jesus, my Savior, will walk with me, he will talk with me, he will walk with me. In joy or in sorrow, today and tomorrow, I know he will Let's stand and sing one verse of blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, just before the message of living water. This is a song that takes you back to childhood days, doesn't it? All right, everyone sing heartily. Blessed Father, as we open up thy word in a few moments, may the Holy Spirit reveal the Lord Jesus to every needy, needy heart today. Supply every need according to thy riches in glory by Christ Jesus, for we ask it in his name. Amen. You're listening to the Old Fashioned Revival Hour coming to you from the Municipal Auditorium at Long Beach, California. This is Charles D. Fuller speaking. The river of thy grace is flowing free, we launch upon its steps to sail to thee. In the ocean of thy love we soon shall be, we are sailing to eternity. Earth is joys that help compare with all the glory, when our longing eyes shall see thy face. We shall have the fellowship forever, in the splendor of the
broadcast uh, of our 24th anniversary of radio work would not be complete unless we have the quartet sing my favorite song, This World Is Not My Home. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. I fixed it up with Jesus many years ago. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Just over in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, oh, you know, oh, I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. God's Word tells us as believers that we are pilgrims and strangers here. Our home is up in heaven. Will you take your Bibles, please, and turn to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. At verse 10, underline the last two words, living water. And also in the, tw- in the 15th verse, underline these words, give me this water. The words living water form the basis of my message today on this, the 24th anniversary of our radio work. And at the conclusion of this message, my earnest prayer will be that many, like the sinful outcast woman of long ago, will cry out, give me this living water to drink. Now, this fourth chapter of the Gospel of John records a most heart-appealing scene. Our Lord, clothed in the form of sinful flesh, was weary from his journey through Samaria. At midday, that is six hours after sunrise, he came to the edge of Jacob's well and sat down there on to wait for a lonely, sinful, outcast woman of the city of Sychar to come. Now Jesus knew that she was on the way from the city to the well, for he knows the end from the beginning. He knew that she would come at noon in the heat of the day to draw water, For you know it was the usual custom for the women of Sychar to meet at Jacob's well in the early morning hours or at the eventide hours to draw water and to meet in a sociable way to exchange 
the news of the day. But this sinful woman, however, subject of much harsh and bitter local gospel, uh, gossip, an outcast from Sychar society, came at midday to draw water. She did not wish to meet her accusers face to face and hear her name used as a common subject of conversation. She was, in fact, she did not expect even to meet anyone at midday under the heat of the oriental sun. But there at Jacob's well, this lonely, heart-hungry woman meets the Lord and her soul thirsty for the spiritual living water that she knew nothing of but needed for satisfaction. Later, at the close of the conference with the Creator of all things, she cries, Give me this water to drink. For whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Let's begin at verse 7 and just look through some of the verses quickly. Jesus began the conversation with this outcast woman in a perfectly natural way. He says there in verse 7, Give me to drink. Startled at this request, the woman replies in the ninth verse, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which I am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Christ would not be put aside or sidetracked. And beginning with the tenth verse, he leads her to the thought of a gift. If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And now notice the woman's reply in verse 11. How it reveals the natural heart in a fourfold way. First of all, her reply, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Four things that reveals her lost condition and is a typical example of every unregenerated heart, of every heart that is not washed in God's precious blood. First, notice the blindness of her sinful heart. Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. She saw the Lord as a mere man, even to void of any material thing, such as a water pot, such as she had. She did not realize that the one seated on the edge of Jacob's well that day was not only the creator of all things material, but the fountain of true, living, spiritual water, the well of salvation. She was spiritually blinded. And I want to stop here and say that every soul outside of Christ, you are spiritually blinded to spiritual things, for the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. For Satan, the God of this present world system, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And Satan will do everything in his power to keep you away from the light of the gospel. As this woman looked upon this Christ as mere man, many today 
put him along the side of other religious leaders, mere man, except those of us who are saved. We know that he is and was God manifest in the flesh. Notice in the second place, this woman being occupied with material things. Nothing to draw with. Behold in this sinful woman an accurate portrayal of a sinner. His mind is occupied with material things. And Satan again will use anything to keep a soul from the knowledge of the Savior and keep you wrapped up in material, temporal, passing things. In this case, the woman's mind was centered upon the lack of a water pot. The Savior had nothing to draw with. And Satan will keep you busy, occupied with material, temporal things, to keep you away from the best, that is, the living, eternal, spiritual realities and living water. How many of you right now are taken up with the cares of this age and the deceitfulness of riches? No concern as to your soul's salvation and partaking of a drink of living water that will bring soul satisfaction for eternity. Third, notice the woman's concentration on the means rather than the end. She was occupied with something to draw with rather than occupied with Christ. Like in the home at Bethany, Mary and Martha and the brother. How Martha was encumbered about with much serving. Christ was in the home. But Mary sat at his feet. Yeah.